right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Pete Bowen, who is literally just up the road in Orange County, California. How are you doing, Pete? Doing well today, yourself? Oh, doing fantastic, thank you. And Pete is an expert on high performance leadership, organizational culture and ethics. He's been practicing and teaching leadership for more than 30 years in business, education and the military. And I saw you were, you were, you flew the Harrier jump jets, is that right? That I did, survived, uh, survived doing that. Harrier pilot number 330. Wow. And, um, and here's just a little bit of, uh, you know, shows like how small the world is. My uncle, uh, God rest him, uh, he actually worked on the Harrier, the original Harrier jump jet engines. Well, he good. Build the engines. There you go. Thanks for that service. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So today we're going to talk about three easy steps to start a relationship within the context of covenant leadership. And so, uh, Pete, before we start even, can you baseline what covenant leadership is? Covenant leadership is a very simple way to understand leadership in life. It's based on, uh, it's grounded in an 80 year ongoing Harvard study that uh, looked at adult development in over 100 functions for several thousand people for 80 years. And the conclusion of that study is that happiness in life comes from good, high quality relationships, period. Um, it's not money, it's not social uh, status, and it's not uh, your education level. So uh, if you want happiness in life, it's all about the relationships and everything else is a distraction. So leadership is the same thing. Leadership is just really high quality, high trust relationships. When we landed on aircraft carriers, we had airplanes behind us 25 seconds behind us. We had to land touchdown, go to idle, and get out of that traffic area in 25 seconds or so. And we would trust a 19-year-old who didn't get particularly great grades in some local high school to steer us around that flight deck. And even though we might outrank him, when he gave us a, a signal to go left rudder or right rudder, taxing us around that deck, we did what he said instantly because the trust was absolute. And there were times you'd look out of the airplane and see water in front of you and water <laughs> on the side, and he'd keep you taxiing, know that your wheel might come within a foot or two of the edge of the deck. And you just did what he said. You didn't have time to question and wonder. So high trust relationships are the key to high performance relationships. And what we want to do is teach people three ways to build really high trust relationships, whether it's at work or in their family or even in the relationship with themselves. So we teach them to seek wisdom. The more people trust your knowledge and your character, the more they'll follow you. We tell them to practice love because when people know that you love them, they're inspired to perform. And if you can do agape love, which is the kind of love we have in the military where we're willing to die for each other, that's where you get the deepest commitment and the highest performance. And then the last thing is you gotta get results. People have got to know that you can make the shot, close the deal, drive the project through to completion. So there's three things that build high quality relationships. You've got to do this with yourself. You've got to do it with your family and friends, and you've got to do it at work and in the community. So seek wisdom, practice love, get results. And then when I'm working with junior people, one of their questions is, well, how do I start a conversation? Um, the very initial thing of just getting a conversation going and starting a relationship in any context is a difficult one. So we help them with three, three points to start a good conversation. So uh, just coming back to the first one there, seeking wisdom. I mean, in many ways, right, we, live in a, we live in a strange time uh, in a very, what I always call the shortcut culture, where people just want everything instantly. They don't want to work for anything. They don't really want knowledge or wisdom on a deep level. They just want a soundbite here or a soundbite there. Or just give it. How do you help people understand what seeking wisdom means and why that is so critical and why wisdom and, wisdom and, and, and bits of information are not the same thing? Uh, right. There's a difference between wisdom is the uh, knowledge that comes with habituating something. And I give an example of uh, learning how to use the brake on a car. Mm -hmm. You can read about using a brake on a car. You can know that you press the brake to stop or slow down and you've got the knowledge. 
but you don't get wise at using a brake in a car until you get in a car and do it dozens or hundreds of times until you know how much pressure to put on in which situations, what your closure is, when you have to stop hard, what you do on snow or rain. And so the wisdom comes with practicing it over and over and over. You take the knowledge, you practice it until it's a part of your habit and part of your character. And that's just one example, but you want a doctor, a surgeon to have wisdom when he's operating on you. And you want a, an airline pilot to have wisdom when he has an emergency or she has an emergency in the airplane. And you want the bank to have wisdom when uh, they're uh, monitoring the money in your bank accounts. So wisdom is a really critical thing to build high trust. And if, frankly, on a business scale, if you want to make money, people have to trust your knowledge and your character or they won't do business with you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, it's, and there's no shortcut to wisdom. And I think that's the thing that people need to understand, like wisdom. And it's an ongoing thing, right? You just don't, you, you know, it'd be fantastic if you could, but you just don't gain a ton of wisdom in one shot and then you're done. Uh, and again, as I said, this is kind of pushing a little bit against the pervasive culture today. So I think it's more critical than ever that people understand that gathering wisdom is an, is an ongoing pursuit but it also takes time and application. It's a life, it goes on your entire life. You'll never stop uh, gaining wisdom. And the same thing with practicing love. If you, mm -hmm. want, if you want people to really be willing to give you commitment where they're willing to die for you, then they have to know that they love you. And it's, it's uh, surprising how much people want love and how small things can have a huge impact. And we use the word love instead of, really care about people because we're talking about love and we have to be serious about it. When I work with law enforcement or military, I say the word love and I get a little bit of a, well, you know, I don't know. And then mm -hmm. within 10 seconds, somebody goes, are you kidding me? This is who we are. It's the business people that don't want to talk about love much and that's okay. We'll go kick their tails in the business world because our people will love us. If you've got great relationships with your people, because they know they trust your wisdom, that you love them and that you get results, you'll get more engagement and productivity. If your clients trust you, trust your wisdom, your love and, your, and you get results, they'll give you more business. It's almost an unfair competitive advantage and it's all about relationships. So how can you, how can somebody tell the difference between where you have, an, you have a leader and an employer who, who cares about you who, genuinely and, and one that you can feel like has a, you know, has a deeper, as you say, like a, a, has a love for you and really wants you to succeed? I mean, how do you, how do you tell the difference? Well, 70% of people leave their jobs because they don't like their manager, mm. right? So they're not feeling it. The default is they're not feeling it. They're treated like a resource, human resources. And what we need to do is really treat people like the really important thing, excuse me, the really important person that they are. And it's amazing how just a little bit of love will drive, uh, drive people into, they, I've got one client who's got a thousand employees and any one of them would get in front of a truck for this guy in a heartbeat because he knows their name and he, even if they're number 980 working as a technician, he knows their name and when he meets the spouse, he can tell the spouse something that that employee contributes that's specific. Mm -hmm. And he's got, he's got future employees stacked up at competitors to come work for him. So a right. little bit of love goes a huge way. And just to, and just for people to be clear, because sometimes when when people hear stuff like this, they think, well, it all sounds a bit fuzzy and everything. But if you think about um, real love, right, it also means that you are prepared to have the difficult conversations. You're prepared sure. to put somebody on the right track. It's not it's not this fluffy thing. It's uh, uh, it's it's uh, when the time at the right times, it's tough. Love is when you want what's best for somebody else which very often doesn't coincide with what they desire or want at that time. My kid wants to eat ice cream for breakfast. I don't love my kid if I give my kid ice cream. It's, I, I've got to practice something there. So when you really love somebody, you care about them really succeeding, and that means really learning. Love is an action, not a feeling. If you want to get strong, you do push-ups. 
push-ups and love are both actions. The feeling of, I feel really good or I'm really sore after I do the push-ups, those are just the feelings. But love is, a, is an action, and when it becomes a habit, it really transforms people. And for the young people out there, if you really want to change the world in your work, go to work with people that love you, that you can practice love with, because when you change the world by changing the people in it. Mm -hmm. If you think we have unwise leadership in our nation, just remember that it's a reflection of the unwise people doing the electing. So if you want a great world, we need wise people to make good decisions, whether it's in business or politics or the military. So yeah, wisdom and love go hand in hand. And then again, you've got to close the deal. You got to make the basketball shot. You, you, you've got to get results or, or they won't follow you. Yeah, and I and I think that's a that's a that's an incredibly important part because that kind of balances it out. So, it's a, you know, gather wisdom, show love, but it is about results at the end of the day. Because if it's too, if if you have the first two without the third, then something is going awry. The reason the Navy SEALs, the reason the Marine Corps, the reason they're top organizations is because. They trust each other's knowledge and character, that's the wisdom, and they love each other, and they know they'll be there and they can get it done. That's it. They wrap it up in a good story. I just did a, a good article on uh, how the Marine Corps used its story to go from being eliminated, they were going to get rid of the Marine Corps, and how it saved itself with the story against people like Eisenhower and Truman and Marshall. So Seek wisdom, practice love, get results, wrapping up in a good story of how you're making the world a better place by making the people in your company better, right? And mm -hmm. then, um, and, and that's the leadership program as well. It's, it's covenant leadership is what you do and it's what builds the leader. So there's no special additional leadership program where you're chasing ladders and cheese and all this other stuff. Yeah, and and obviously there are no sh there are no shortcuts here either because these are these are things that you actually need to apply yourself to. It's not this isn't a quick fix. Well, you can't uh, you 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 can't get under three hundred pounds of weight and lift it. The only way you're going to lift three hundred pounds of weight is by having been under that weight a long time. If you mm. think you're going to show up in a situ, if you think you can show up on the, the Super Bowl football field and you're going to throw a touchdown pass because this time you really are, you never will. It's all about the preparation that you put into it. And it's a slog and it's hard, but that also builds the tenacity and the grit and the perseverance that will distinguish you from the people who don't and the teams that don't. And that's why you'll beat them. And as you mentioned earlier, you were saying that uh, some people like really struggle with opening a conversation in order to start even building relationships in the first place. Uh, could you just go back to that? You were saying you also give advice on how to do that. Sure. There's, uh, uh, we don't teach people some simple techniques on things. So just opening a conversation, it doesn't matter if it's a business associate or somebody you run in the street or romantic interest. There's three things uh, I recommend people do. One is ask them what's their story. So the first thing I do is say, what's your story? And that gets the conversation off and they can, it's open-ended and they can respond whatever the way they, they want. You can ask questions on that. If they tell you about their family, sort of make mental notes. If you know they've got a 12 year old, you know the kid was born, the child was born in 2008. Down the road, if you do the math and you ask, how's that fifth grader doing? They'll be really impressed that you cared enough mm -hmm. to remember. So find out what their story is. The second thing is find out what their professional challenge is. If you can understand the problem they're facing that's causing them stress and you can do something to help them solve it, then all of a sudden they know you care, you're valuable to them, you, you've got a mode to build trust right there that's, that's, uh, that has a lot of impact. And then the third thing is what's their passion? What do they do for fun? So I've learned about car restoration. I've learned about how to shrimp fish in the Gulf. I've learned enormous amounts about hunting and salmon fishing and off-road racing. Because when I meet with these people and I've had that conversation, like today I met with a client and I said, hey, how is the fishing, uh, the salmon fishing? And he was telling me how they're about to go uh, crab pot fishing um, in Tamales Bay up north and then, uh, and, and uh, something else. But, but you learn a lot about those things that you never would have found out otherwise. So it's a really good way to broaden your knowledge about about things. So what's your story? 
find out in the conversation what's important to them professionally and find out what their passion is and then mm -hmm. actively listen to them rather than prepare your own response. So that's yeah. how you learn. And then the other thing is you listen with love. You have to mentally practice really loving them no matter who they are. I don't care if it's a homeless, a dirty, uh, un, unclean, nasty smelling homeless person. They're all human beings. And when we practice loving even the toughest human beings, that's when we get really good at it. That's when people commit to us. Yeah, and and, uh, and there's a couple of things you mentioned there that I just want to underline. The first thing is when you were saying about, you know, listening to somebody's story or whatever, you have to be, you have to have curiosity, right? you have to genuinely be curious about learning from other people. Again, as I said, unfortunately, you know, our, our pervasive culture is a little bit too me centric. So you have to actually suspend that for a moment and actually start listening to other people. And as you say, then actively listening rather than thinking about what, uh, what you're going to say, because the biggest compliment you can pay to somebody is to ask them about themselves and then actually listen to what they say. And if you listen to what they say and you figure out where they're coming from and why they think the way they do, all of a sudden you find all these other points that you can touch that are important to them that you can build trust with. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I, uh, I'll do a lot of work with law enforcement. I'll, I'll interview people from uh, more radical groups as part of that. And, I'll, and it, we'll have a two hour conversation or three hour conversation. And it'll all be about why do you think the way they do, what's important to you and everything else. And, and those insights become really valuable for dealing with these people as human beings that may be very opposed to how you are politically or whatever, but they're still human beings. They still deserve respect. They still deserve our love. And understanding them builds a relationship where we can move forward from it rather than, you know, just be nasty to each other. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great message and, and obviously something that we we need because clearly like shouting at each other and telling, you know, when I always found that if you shout at somebody and tell them they're stupid, you rarely change their mind about anything. <laughs> well, one of the things we forget is that we're neurologically, we're biologically wired for love. If you take an infant and you give it all the food and water it needs, but you don't give it physical, give that infant physical affection, 40% mm -hmm. of them will die half of the rest are going to have severe psychological challenges. The scariest villain in a movie isn't a slasher that, you know, stabs everybody. The scariest villain in a movie is something that looks like a human being, but you don't have, you don't sense any love or humanness in that entity. Mm -hmm. Because, because that's, that lack of love is, is, if you really want to get into it, that's where the evil is. So people respond to love because that's how we're wired. That's why they ask, uh, you know, people that spend a lot of time in jail, what's the matter? Didn't your mother love you? I mean, there's right. reasons for these things. And, and so that the more you practice loving everybody in your life, the more you'll appreciate yourself, the better your mental health will be, the more you'll appreciate your spouse and your children. You can't really love your, if you want to really take care of your kids, then you better push your wisdom and your love as far as you possibly can in your work world and in every other aspect of your life so you can bring it home to the kids and vice versa what you learn with the kids you can take back and build tighter relationships with people at work and that's why covenant leadership is really simple really straightforward and and really effective yeah no, i love it and great way to to finish up here pete that's fantastic uh, Great insights for people. Um, all of Pete's information will be below this video. But before we go, Pete, do you, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, my wife would say I'm a guy who can never keep a job. So uh, I studied intellectual history in undergraduate and graduate school. And, uh, and then when I was in the Marine Corps and I moved, I did everything from IT and programming to flying jets, uh, to logistics. And, and that I'm a generalist. And that, that fact I've been in a lot of places and had a lot of different kinds of experiences gives some of that wisdom that's important. And then people taught me about the importance of the love because I wasn't very good at it. And it's something, like you said, it's a never ending thing for wisdom, for love, and for being able to drive things, projects through to completion. And those are the three keys. So now I wanna help spread that 
to help people have happier lives that also make some more money and with a happier family win all the way around yeah and to be honest who doesn't who doesn't need that and that's what the world needs now it needs more happy people uh, prosperous successful people and it's funny when people are happy and they're pr and prosperous and a lot of these other extraneous issues and seem to go away well if you want if you want something that'll really get you nobody told millennials and gen z that life's about happiness mm -hmm. they, it's literally if you talk to them and i'm speaking broadly nobody told them that life's about happiness and there's some very good articles by millennials like millennial burnout by ann helen peterson and when you find that disconnect that they're on this rat race of life with no end to it, chasing to-do lists, you find out why there's so many challenges. So one of those things is, is simply to say, hey, life's about happiness and this will get you there and make you what much more successful as a leader mm -hmm. of work and with your family, all the above. Yeah, perfect, I love it. Listen, thanks, Pete. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all again soon, thank you. Mm -hmm.